Hey guys, welcome back. We are going to start a fresh session in pulmonary medicine critical care and that will be on toxicology. Toxicology is a very very important topic for your exams and it's been an important topic for a very long period of time. In fact, from 2005-2006 paper, if you see every year, you get at least one to two questions from this very important topic, especially in your need PG exam. The only difference in the last two to three years is the fact that your INACT has also joined the league and it has also started asking a lot of questions from this very common topic. And it's important not just because it's asked in exams, it's important not just because it's an emergency medicine topic, it's important because it's a very common day-to-day -day topic. So any practitioner will be dealing with a poisoned individual in his day-to-day -day practice. That's why it's important and it can be handled easily by an intern itself. And we're going to split the section into two. In the first section, we'll be discussing on various important toxidromes and how to handle a poison patient in the emergency at a basic level. And in the second section, we'll be discussing in detail about uh, each and every individual toxin and how to treat them. And probably we'll be discussing on the snake bite also. Even though snake bite is a kind of an environmental emergency, but still snake venom is a kind of a toxin only. So we can include that also under toxicology itself. So let us move on to the topic with this brief introduction. And I would like to first discuss about the basics of how to handle a poison patient in the emergency room. I would call that as ABCDFG of toxicology. In that ABC stands for airway, breathing and circulation as usual. And there is a lot of chance that a poison patient might have sustained some injuries because they could have tried other modes of suicide like hanging or falling from height or under the influence of poison they could have fell down somewhere. So you need to do a quick trauma survey. And if you are suspecting a possible injury to the cervical spine, you need to definitely consider stabilizing cervical spine with the help of some special manner. So what are the maneuvers that are helpful in stabilizing the cervical spine? We'll talk about that in detail in a separate session, not here. When it comes to D, we have three Ds actually. The first D is all about drugs. Second D is all about drawing bloods in the emergency. And third D is all about decontamination techniques. Let us discuss about the first D, that is drugs. And you need to have all the drugs that are necessary to resuscitate the patient as per your ACLS protocol in your emergency room. For that matters, if the patient is under cardiac arrest, it's a deadly scenario. So what are the drugs you will require as per your ACLS protocol? You need adrenaline. Adrenaline is one of the very important drugs to maintain cardiac perfusion in the setting of cardiac arrest. And of course, adrenaline can be given in both shockable as well as non-shockable rhythms. And you can try other drugs like amiodarone or lignocaine but this can be given only in the setting of shockable rhythms like pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation but it cannot be used in the setting of non-shockable rhythms like pulseless electrical activity and asystole that is flatline. And apart from that in the setting of bradycardia but with a pulse without a pulse it becomes cardiac arrest. If there is a bradycardia with a pulse but if the patient is not stable showing some signs of hemodynamic instability then you need to give atropine. So you have to have that drug ready in your tray as well. In case if the patient is not responding to your atropin and if you require pacing but if pacing is not available at that point of time then you can even try chronotropic drugs like dopamine or adrenaline. So you need to have various vasopressors and chronotropic drugs like dopamine and adrenaline in your tray as well. And in case if the patient is in shock one of the first drugs that we give in most situations is going to be noradrenaline because noradrenaline is considered to be a vasopressor of choice in the setting of any shock for that matters as we discussed already. So that also has to be ready in your tray. Apart from that, if you are dealing with a tachyarrhythmia and if you are dealing with a possible ventricular tachycardia, for example, if you are dealing with a white complex tachycardia that is kind of a regular, you are suspecting a ventricular tachycardia based on your ECG findings and the clinical picture, then you may try some antiarrhythmic drug infusions. Usually we give amiodarone, but you can try other drugs like prokinamid or even sotalol, depending on the situation. And soda bicarbonate is also a very important drug, which can be used in the setting of acidosis. And soda bicarbonate uh, can be used in the setting of toxicology because many toxins can result in significant acidosis. For that matter, soda bicarbonate is very, very useful. And apart from that, in certain specific scenarios, like tricyclic antidepressant induced white QRS or ventricular tachyarrhythmia. The next immediate treatment will be soda bicarbonate only. We'll talk about that in detail in a separate session, not here. And apart from that, if you are thinking about a supraventricular tachycardia, a SVT, 
It's quite rare in the setting of toxicology. But if you're dealing with the patient with SVT, then you might need adenosine, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and many other drugs in that regard. But even though we have plenty of drugs that are essential to resuscitate the individual, I would say the very basic requirement will be at least adrenaline, amiodarone, atropine, noradrenaline, dopamine, and soda bicarbonate. So this is the very basic requirement. And these drugs should be always available in your emergency room. And apart from that, you can even consider the usage of your universal antidotes. So what are the universal antidotes? It can be remembered by the mnemonic DON'T. So the DON'T drugs, again, should always be available in your emergency. So what are the drugs that come under this DON'T? First is dextrose. Of course, in the setting of hypoglycemia, you need dextrose. You can consider the usage of oxygen in the setting of hypoxemia and tissue hypoxia. You can consider the usage of naloxone in the setting of opioid intoxication. And finally, T stands for time in which you can consider in the setting of suspected vernicus encephalopathy. Especially if your patient is alcoholic, presenting with altered mental status, you can well consider the usage of thiamine. So don't stand for dextrose, oxygen, naloxone and thiamine. These are universal antidotes. And the second D will be all about drawing bloods. And we can split the blood investigation into essential blood investigation, the setting of toxicology practice and potentially useful, which can be done only in selected clinical situations. What are the essential blood tests? Of course, you need to do a full blood count. That is a complete blood count and a basic metabolic panel. So what is basic metabolic panel? You're going to do urea, creatinine, uric acid, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, uh, random blood sugar. And of course, uh, some institutes use some other electrolytes like calcium, magnesium also under basic metabolic panel. But in our hospital, we do this much only. So urea, creatinine, uric acid, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate and random blood sugar. So this comes under basic metabolic panel. And of course, you need to do coagulation profile also like prothrombin time and INR and a partial thromboplastin time. And ABG is an indispensable investigation in the emergency room and in the critical care practice. So definitely all patients with suspected poisoning should undergo a arterial blood gas analysis. And what are the potentially useful tests that can be used in selected situations? For example, if you are suspecting a toxic alcohol poisoning, then serum osmolality will be very useful to look at the osmolal gap. What is osmolal gap? We'll discuss in the next section. And you may need to consider doing certain drug levels. Like for example, you can perform salicylate levels, paraquat levels. You can perform choline estrase levels in the setting of OPC poisoning. Or you can perform valparate levels, phenytoin levels, digoxin levels, lithium levels. So depending on the situation that you are dealing with, you can perform a specific drug level also. You can order for that. You can consider doing other electrolytes also like calcium, magnesium or phosphorus. And LFT is also very important in the setting of parastamol poisoning or probably if you think about acute iron toxicity. So where definitely liver function will be deranged. Like you can expect a transaminidase like increased SGOT or SGPT or bilirubin may be increased. Or you can look at albumin also which is kind of a prognostic marker. And lactate is very important in many situations especially when it comes to carbon monoxide poisoning or methemoglobinemia or cyanide poisoning, lactate elevation it may be the only sign in early stages. And ketones are also very important, especially in the setting of alcohol intoxication or probably in the setting of isopropanol intoxication. We'll talk about that in detail in the coming section, not now. And even creatine kinase sometimes can be useful because various poisons can cause muscle injury and even they can result in frank rhabdomyolysis. That is the reason even creatine kinase will give you a lot of idea about what's going on. So these are the other tests that you can possibly try in the setting of your toxicology practice. But it depends on the underlying clinical situation and the toxin that the patient has consumed. The second D stands for decontamination. This is very important when it comes to emergency medicine. And why do you do decontamination? Because to reduce the absorption of toxin from skin, eyes or from the GI tract. So GI decontamination is the one that we perform regularly in any toxicology individual. But you can even consider dermal decontamination and ocular decontamination as well. So what do you mean by dermal decontamination? You're going to remove the clothing and you're going to give saline or uh, distilled water irrigation, especially for toxins that can be easily absorbed from the skin and the mucosal surfaces. For example, in India, one of the common poisons that you encounter is 
organophosphorus poison and organophosphates are something that can be easily absorbed from the skin and the mucosal surfaces that is the reason why you need to immediately remove clothing and you have to give a thorough irrigation with saline or probably with distilled water throughout the body and make sure that the person who is performing the decontamination maneuver is wearing the gloves because if the poison can be absorbed from the patient's skin it can be well absorbed from your skin also so that's the reason you have to consider wearing gloves strongly and in case if you think that the poison is spilled all over the face and there is a possibility of getting absorbed via the eyes you can consider ocular decontamination as well so you can do that in the form of saline irrigation of the eyes even that is warranted but as i told you the most important and the most common decontamination technique that we perform in the emergency room in a poisoned individual is going to be gastrointestinal decontamination this can be achieved with three different maneuvers or procedures the first one is single dose activated charcoal which is the most common maneuver that is performed in the emergency room in a poisoned individual or you can try multi dose activated charcoal or even whole bowel irrigation depending on the type of poison that you are dealing with let us discuss gi decontamination techniques alone in a little bit of depth and detail first as i told you single dose activated charcoal is the most common technique that is performed in the emergency room for most poisons so the standard dose of activated charcoal will be 1 gram per kilogram or you can use a dose of 10 gram of activated charcoal per gram of the toxin that is ingested and the maximum dose will be 50 gram in most adults it will be mixed with h2o and will be prepared in the form of a slurry that can be taken up orally in most situations it's going to have a kind of a controversial use to be honest why because some researchers believe that the efficacy of activated charcoal is not that great in absorbing the toxins and by the time you give activated charcoal majority of the toxin have already been absorbed or would have passed to the distal intestine so that it will not be that effective and it's also going to increase the risk of certain complications like aspiration and probably even gastrointestinal perforation but nevertheless it's one of the most common techniques that is performed in the emergency room in most hospitals for most poisons and we have to be wary of the contraindications as well so where it is contraindicated of course in suspected bowel obstruction or if the patient is having a frank small bowel obstruction definitely we are not going to give activated charcoal we are not going to do anything by mouth for that matters and in late presentations especially the patient is presenting after 1 to 2 hours of uh, toxin ingestion it's better to avoid because you won't have any toxin that is left in the gi to get absorbed by the activated charcoal everything would have been already ad- absorbed and giving activated charcoal in this situation is only going to increase risk of complications without much benefit that's why it's better to avoid in case of unprotected airway suppose the patient is having altered mental status or the patient is having poor gcs then it's better to avoid as well because the risk of aspiration in this situation is very high certain toxins don't get absorbed to activated charcoal very well that's why in that situation also it's better to avoid what are the examples of toxins that don't get adsorbed to activated charcoal very well like heavy metals best example will be acute iron poisoning inorganic ions the best example will be lithium poisoning corrosive poisoning like acid or alkali poisoning hydrocarbon poisoning like kerosene petrol alcohols especially toxic alcohols like methanol ethylene glycol isopropanol essential oils boric acid so told you all these toxins are not going to get adsorbed to activated charcoal very well so that's the reason it's better to avoid activated charcoal in this setting as well you can try another procedure called as multi dose activated charcoal the dose of activated charcoal will be the same it will be 50 g in total but you are going to give it in a phased manner like initially you will give a 12.5 g over one hour then the next one hour you will give another 12.5 after one hour you give another 12.5 and finally the fourth hour you give another 12.5 or some textbooks say you can give 25 g wait for two hours after two hours give another 25 g the total dose is the same but you are going to give in a split manner or in a phased manner so why you do that because certain drugs undergo extensive enterohepatic circulation which means if you are going to reduce the concentration of that drug in the gut then whatever drug that is absorbed already into the portal system can be pulled back into the gat and you can trap them and you can eliminate it via activated charcoal so that is why it should be tried only in drugs with extensive enterohepatic circulation where the idea is to pull the absorbed drug back to the gat and eliminate it so what are the drugs that undergo extensive enterohepatic circulation where you can use multi dose activated charcoal four drugs i used to remember by the mnemonic cpt c stands for carbamazepine p stands for phenobarbital and t stands for theophylline additionally you can remember quinine also 
So CPT plus Q. Carmazepin, phenobarbitone, theophylline, and quinine. These are the drugs that undergo extensive enteropathic circulation so that you can make use of multidose activated charcoal. And we have a third procedure called as whole bubble irrigation. So what is whole bubble irrigation? You are going to give polyethylene glycol that is pegged orally and the dose will be 500 to 2000 ml per hour. In children you can try a dose of 500 to 1000 ml per hour. In adults you can try a dose of 1500 to 2000 ml per hour. How long you are going to give? The goal is to achieve a point where you see a clear effluent in the rectum without any contamination. So what you are trying to do is you are trying to increase the GI motility and whatever drug that is unabsorbed wherever in the GIT you are going to try and pull it out via the rectum by giving polyethylene glycol. It can be used in certain selected situations. What are the indications? You can remember in the form of LIMPS, L-I-M-P-S. So L stands for lithium, I stands for iron, M stands for other heavy metals, P stands for packers, that is body packers. You know body packers are going to conceal the drugs within them. So to get that drugs out, you can use whole bubble irrigation as well. And for sustained release preparations also, whole bubble irrigation will be very effective. Why? Because when you talk about sustained release preparation, you are not going to release the drug immediately. There won't be rapid release. There will be a very slow release and sustained release that is happening over a long period of time. So, there is a possibility that there will be a proportion of drug that will be left unabsorbed in the GIT for a long period of time. So, you are going to target that unabsorbed portion of the drug and you are going to try and remove it via whole bowel irrigation. That is why for sustained release preparations also it is going to be very helpful. So, what are the contraindications? Of course, you cannot do whole bowel irrigation in the setting of suspected ileus, especially if the gut is not moving properly or the gut is not moving at all. Then in that situation, you cannot give whole bowel irrigation. Whatever peg you give is only going to stay in the gut. It's not going to come out. In suspected gastrointestinal perforation or in suspected obstruction of the intestine, let it be a small bowel or large bowel obstruction, you cannot perform whole bowel irrigation. So these are general contraindications for any GE decontamination procedure. It's not just for your whole bowel irrigation though. And historically, we have been performing certain maneuvers like gastric lavage via Ryle's tube. And we used to give cathartics and induce vomiting with the help of certain drugs like Ipecac syrup. And these maneuvers are not currently recommended to be performed in the emergency room because these maneuvers are going to do more harm than good as per the current research. So avoid all this. Let us move on to the next letter in toxicology that is E. E stands for two things. First E is all about enhancing elimination, which you can do by one of the three principles that is urinary alkalinization, hemodialysis or IV intralipid administration and second E stands for exposing and examining the patient. Why? Because you need to look for some specific tox syndromes. So what do you mean by tox syndrome? It is a syndromic appearance of a particular toxin. So that's why it's called as tox syndrome. So once you know that the patient is having a specific tox syndrome, you give a particular antidote for that. So that's why we need to examine and expose the patient in the first place. F stands for full vitals, definitely continuous BP and pulse rate monitoring is very very important for almost all poison individuals and if the situation warrants and if you have the facility, you can attach a continuous ECG monitor as well. And selected situations, for example, anticholinergic tox syndrome, the patient will have urinary retention, so foleys may be important in that situation. And definitely, X-rays can be considered in certain poisons like paracord poisoning where chest X-ray becomes very important. And in acute iron poisoning, to look at the number of pills in the stomach or in the intestine, your abdominal X-ray is also very important in that situation. So depending on the toxin, you can perform different, different investigations. And G stands for giving specific antidotes and treatments. Depending on the poison ingested, if you know that the poison has an antidote, so what stops you from giving it, just go ahead. 